burada. Şimdi Fintech Dijital Bankacılık Gurusu, The Financer CEO'su ve Value Web kitabının yazarı Chris Skinner'la, Skinner'la birlikte olacağız. Oyun değişiyor. Fintech, blockchain ve değer takası başlıklı konuşmasıyla bizlerle birlikte olacak. Kendisi konuşması sonrasında Hezer Fens alanında e, imza töreninde olacak e, bilginize. We would like to invite Chris Skinner. Thank you and good morning. And uh, I guess you're in this room if you're interested in fintech, in that that's what I tend to spend most of my time and my life talking and writing about. Um, and I have a presentation which is going to be up in any second. Oop. So um, I guess from the introduction, you know that I am involved in lots of different things. Uh, I actually spend most of my time flying around the world talking with people in financial services about technology and talking to people in technology about financial services. And for over 10 years, I've been writing about such ideas every single day on my blog, thefinancer.com. And because it's now cool to be in technology and finance, fintech, I'm now cool. And normally I turn up with no tie, but I thought this would be formal, so I'm wearing my tie today. Um, I've written a number of books because I write so much every day and in 2014 Digital Bank came out and its timing was very appropriate and it is available in Turkish, it's been translated, along with Value Web which came out in 2016 which has also been translated into Turkish. And I have a new book coming out in spring next year called Digital Human, The Fourth Revolution of Humanity Includes Everyone. And I'm going to talk about those themes for the next 40 minutes. And then I believe there's a book signing for those who want a book um, a immediately after this presentation. Um, you're the first people to see this book, by the way. It's uh, just co designed the cover the other day. So uh, th this is unique for Turkey. Um, I guess digital human is rooted in the fact that we've had several revolutions in how humans live, work, and cooperate. And the last major revolution was the Industrial Revolution, which was quite a phenomena because it meant that we could move away from living in small towns to traveling around the world, thanks to steam. And steam ships and steam power created the ability to create global trade and commerce and global businesses, internationalization. And because of that internationalization, we had to find some way in which people trading across borders could trade with each other with trust. And so the Industrial Revolution invented banking. And it was invented so that we could trade across borders with trust because banks have licenses from governments that recognize that you can trust them. They can issue paper notes and paper checks and you can trust that the check is good for the money because the bank is licensed by the government to say you can trust this institution. In fact, banking is the only operation anywhere that can be a secure store of value with trust because no other institution has that regulated license. So you can't trust non-financial institutions with storing your money. If they lose your money, you, are, you won't get it back. With a regulated bank, you will. So the major innovation in the Industrial Revolution was putting a check in the post. And unfortunately, for some, they still do this today. And it is very slow and expensive. I had a check from an American client recently that took 28 days to process, almost a month, because it had to go through the SWIFT counterparty network. And the funds had to be in my bank's account before the bank would recognize them into my account. And for that reason, the bank charged me $200 to process this piece of paper. And yet today we live in a real-time, globally connected world where anything can be transmitted anywhere in real time for almost no cost. So why is it that we're still using an industrial era system for transferring money that doesn't work anymore? Equally, this is my wife. She's a little bit blank. She does exist, but we recently went into my bank and my bank said to me that she does not exist. 
even though she was sitting next to me in front of the bank manager. And it's because we recently had two little boys, and as a result, she doesn't travel with me anymore and has no passport. Equally, I pay all the utility bills in my name from my account, so she has no utility bills to show where she lives, so she doesn't exist, according to my bank. Of course she exists, but because identity schemes are based on old customer onboarding processes of know your client using utility bills and passports and driving licenses, if you don't have those things, you do not exist. These are age-old issues that need to be renovated for the digital age, because this age is radically different. In fact, we're going through a revolution, and anybody who thinks digitalization is an evolution of banking as usual has got it wrong, and I'll show you why. Firstly, we need to talk about what really is digital, and most people don't actually define it. It's the thing that has no name that we cannot talk about. What is digital? Digital is a complete reinvention of the financial system, of all systems, into a globally connected platform that can transmit and trade and create relationships and allow us to make business and make friends and make love with anybody in real time globally, if we want to. It's a fundamental rethinking of the core of our operations and systems in government, in commerce, in society, and in finance. It is not just business as usual, cheaper and faster, which is what most people think it is. In fact, those who think it's business as usual, cheaper and faster, are getting wiped out by the internet giants. Industrial era companies are trying to do things cheaper and faster with technology, rather than rethink their businesses with technology. Ford and General Motors and BMW have had to suddenly wake up and go, what is this Tesla thing? and reimagine the way in which they build and make cars. All of the highest value companies these days are digital companies. And the one big difference between a physical industrial era operation and a digital platform operation is you don't need many people to run a digital business because everybody else does the work. The industrial era companies make, assemble, distribute, service, and manage everything. Digital companies just provide a capability to connect people who need something with people who have what they need, like Uber, Airbnb. And this is starting to come through in financial services because when I work with fintech companies, I'm seeing thousands of startup companies doing one thing really well. Whereas the banking system in historical industrial era does a thousand things averagely because we controlled everything. Now we control nothing because we're working in a marketplace of APIs on platforms and services that are digitalized. I think the stunning figure here is that Stripe, which only provides a merchant checkout API, in five years has built a business that's creating 22 times more value than JP Morgan Chase's business that's the highest valued bank in the world, or certainly in the USA. 10 years ago, I was writing about how this revolution would uh, take place. 10 years ago, I was blogging about banking as a service, which everybody now is saying banking as a platform, banking as a service, is the marketplace that we live in. The vision I had 10 years ago is that using APIs, I could plug and play anything into the bank of me, the way I want to bank whether I'm a business or a consumer. I could take a 1,000 APIs from a 1,000 companies doing one thing brilliantly well and put them into my personalized service of finance. This is what is actually happening today. But for most consumers and most businesses, they do not want to integrate a 1,000 companies' APIs. They want one company to do it for them, called a bank. So a bank has to now reimagine itself to find a thousand partners doing one thing brilliantly well and assemble and integrate them into the best customer experience. It's the open sourcing of financial services, open banking, open APIs. So 
this fundamentally changes the business model of a bank. And the business model of a bank is based on a back office that's manufacturing the products and services. A middle office that's processing transactions, connecting front and back office. And a front office that's meant to be really good with customers, to know the customer well. This is where the relationship is. It is no longer in a physical store or branch or office, it's in a device. This business model of banking I've been using for a long, long, long time. You can tell by my gray hair, I've been around a little bit. And during the 1990s, I did a lot of consulting around how to change a bank's operations to be improved faster and differentiated against the competition. One of the books I used back in the 90s was called The Disciplines of Market Leadership by Michael Treke and James Frederick Wersmer. This book says that every business, not just a bank, has a manufacturing, processing, and retailing component. And that these are three separate companies in one entity, manufacturing, processing, retailing. And that most companies only do one of those things well, maybe two of those things well, but hardly any company can do all three things well, manufacturing, processing, retailing. This is why, as I say, banks tend to be very good at products. Most banks, from a consumer's perspective, are pretty poor on the relationship. From a business perspective, most banks are very good on a business relationship, understanding their business needs. But again, they're too product focused. Another book from the 1990s that I used extensively was Reengineering a Corporation by Michael Hammer and James Champy. In this book, they talked about reinventing a business based on products, processes, and people. The products are the back office, the processes are the middle office, the people are where customers and employees engage. Today, this is becoming super important. In the 1990s, we didn't need to change things that much. But one of the key contentions that reengineering the corporation has is you need to look at the front office customer moments of truth and build the business back from that customer viewpoint. Think from the outside in rather than from the inside out. And this is why I keep saying that banks are still talking about pushing products through channels when they should be talking about the customer journey. And some are talking customer journeys, but this was 20 years ago. Today, the customer journey is very different because the products are connecting through platforms to the customer experience in devices. And we can see that very clearly from what's happening with journeys. If I need a journey, then now I just hail one from my device. I can see it coming on a map through Google Maps APIs in my Uber service on my phone or Lyft or whatever else you use. The same with Airbnb. I can need a room and hail someone to see if they've got a room and find that bed this evening through Airbnb far cheaper than the hotel chain. So this is why people say that Airbnb is the biggest hotel chain that owns no rooms. Their rooms are just rented through that platform. The first fintech company I ever saw was in March 2005, 12 years ago. And a gentleman presented an idea of an eBay for money. And the idea was that people who needed money actually don't need money. What they need is to buy something, like a car. So it's not money they need, it's the car they need. And people who have money can invest in those individuals through their platform. This was the idea of peer-to-peer -peer lending, that people who invest their money in the platform get better interest rates on their money than competitors. And people who need a car can borrow money through that platform and pay lower interest rates than through traditional financial services. Obviously they can because everything is done through software servers and algorithms rather than through buildings and humans and offices. The company is called Zopa. And now it's the biggest peer-to-peer -peer lender in Britain. In February 2017, they loaned their three billionth dollar, or two billionth pound, if you prefer English currency. It's about 4% of the UK personal credit loans marketplace, but it's doubling in size year on year. So after 12 years, they're finally getting some traction. And if they keep doubling in size, they'll have a quarter of the UK loans market by the end of this decade. That is significant. 
In fact, most credit savings and payments areas of banking are being eaten by software and startups. This is where the rubber hits the road. So I call it the apps, APIs, and analytics battle for the future. And the differentiation specifically in the back office analytics. The rest is just cream on the cake. But if you look at what's happening with apps, APIs, and analytics, you can see this happening immediately. So for example, it's in the front office, the virality of our di devices, that communication capability of devices. Not just mobile, think of televisions, cars, the home, the smart home. Think of these two guys. And you're probably wondering, who the hell are these two guys? These two guys had a weekend together in 2010 where Iqbal on the left forgot his wallet. And so Andy and Iqbal are developers. They know how to code. And they thought, look, this is really silly. I forgot my wallet. You could sub me for the weekend and we could write down what I'm spending. Or we could develop an app that tracks and does that for us because we both use PayPal. So they created an app called Venmo, which today is transacting billions of dollars, all because two guys in their 20s had a weekend where one of them forgot his wallet. That's how the idea started. Today, Venmo is transacting over $30 billion a year. It got bought by PayPal. It's the biggest social payment system in the USA. And I'll come back later to say, actually, this is not that significant, but it is for Americans. It is significant in terms of showing how quickly something that's social mobile takes off as an app through APIs linking to PayPal. In fact, the APIs get very interesting because I now see hundreds of companies doing application program interfaces, plug and play software that's really brilliant, really easy to use, and does things far easier and cheaper than if I did them through a traditional financial institution. And this is every area of financial services, not just consumer or payments. But the one I've mentioned already, Stripe, was created by these two Irish brothers, John and Patrick Collinson. John's on the left. They started Stripe in 2010 in Silicon Valley because they couldn't get it done in Ireland. And today, they are the youngest billionaires in the world because they started this business that's reimagined online checkout when they were teenagers. Now, I'm making a point here that young people get this idea. APIs transform everything because it makes it very easy to put anything on the net that can be plugged into anything else on the apps. And then the data has moved from big data and cloud into machine learning and artificial intelligence. And this is also getting very interesting. In fact, I think for the first time in my life, I'm seeing the bank's back office having to be recreated for the internet age because it's no longer good enough to use old systems when they cannot compete with the intelligence of machines. You can see how quickly machines are developing, particularly when you watch what Google and DeepMind are doing. They've got to a stage now that it's almost at the level of the singularity, which is a very Kurzweil uh, term. And when the singularity, I'm saying it's close, it's probably about 15 years away, is when machines become more intelligent than you and me. It's coming. In fact, you can see this already in financial services. JP Morgan has an artificial intelligence engine that can analyze contracts in a second that previously took 360,000 hours of legal time. We can get rid of all the lawyers. In UBS, they've got a very interesting application that takes any client's instructions on email and automatically executes the instructions through artificial intelligence in a second that previously would take an average 45 minutes for one person in the bank to administer. I'm not sure what happened there. There was some more stuff there, but anyway. Um, so th th this is why fintech's getting interesting. And it's not disrupting, destroying, or replacing banking. Because banking, it's the only institutions in our banks that are licensed to store money that can be trusted. But they are augmenting banking. That's why we've seen so much investment in 
fintech. In the last four years, $100 billion has been invested in startup companies to reimagine financial services for the internet age. There's a wave of technologies here. It's not just a fintech bucket of everything. There's wealth tech, insure tech, reg tech, blockchain, distributed ledger, mobile wallets, artificial intelligence, machine learning. It's a granularity of everything that's maturing day by day into a reimagination of the business of banking. And we can see these startups obviously in the consumer space because they're visible. But we can see them in the insurance space and in the regulation space and in the wealth management space and in the investment banking space where they're less visible to the public and the media but they should be highly visible to you because that's your market. That's where you work. There's lots of charts that talk about how wholesale and investment banking is being reimagined by technology. But I'll summarize it with just two things, which is blockchain and artificial intelligence. These, to me, are the two biggest transformations of back office of investment institutions. Artificial intelligence is, to me, a little bit like the old joke that I used to tell, which is the investment markets will eventually become an operation that's run by one man and his dog. The man is there to feed the dog. The dog is there to stop the man touching the computers. That was a joke 10 years ago. It's coming true. At least a third of the jobs in banking will disappear in the next decade. At least a third. Some say half. I've already referenced the reasons why, like these two developments. But um, best execution under MIFID and MIFID II. The likelihood of settlement the, pr the cost, the speed of processing, the likelihood of actually getting the order filled are all parts of best execution. Very difficult to manage manually. JP Morgan has automated it using artificial intelligence. Goldman Sachs, CFO, made the comment in February that he used to sit in an office with 600 traders 10 years ago. Now there's just two. If you look at UBS's trading floor in America, in New Jersey, Ten years ago, it had lots of people. Today, there's no one. And just to emphasize that, ten years ago, that was UBS's American trading floor for investments. Today, it's no one. They've all gone. John Cryan recently stood at a conference where I was speaking and said that half of Deutsche Bank's people will be replaced by robots because they're just abacuses. How motivational is that for Deutsche Bank's people? Not very. But you've got to take this. You've got to swallow this. This is why things are changing so fast, because the business model has changed. Warren Buffett, in his latest report, came out and said, you're stupid if you use active fund management. It's a losing bet. He made a bet against active fund management in 2008. And the automated index system has outperformed all of the active traders by five times multiples. 88% returns in the inter automated system, 22% in the active management system. Uh, the only reason I put this picture up is that that monkey was used as a stock picker and got better results than most active fund managers. You know, that's why we are moving to the age of robo-advice, robo-investments, robo-everything. And blockchain in particular is massively transformational. And it's very confusing. But it's the foundation of everything that comes in the next decade. It's the foundation of governments, the foundation of business, the foundation of commerce, the foundation of politics. And such transformational foundational technologies are as important as the invention of the internet. In the 1990s, people thought the internet would disappear. Now think about what the internet means to you and your life. And think about if it disappeared tomorrow, what would that do to your life? The internet has been a foundational, transformational technology, and blockchain is the next one. Distributed ledger, blockchain, terms that we use interchangeably, but they mean very different things. But it's all about creating databases that we can share globally with people we don't trust and know that the database can be trusted because it's run by technology, by algorithms. 
The technology runs typically on a digital currency, of which Bitcoin and Ethereum are the two biggest today. But right now, these are experiments. They're just testing ideas. Do not believe in 10 years that these two will still be around. They might be, but I'm not going to bet my house on them. And I know some people are, so word of warning. It's experiments. I do believe more in Ethereum, mainly because it's being backed by businesses and financial services. So the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance is developing next generation databases for commerce and finance. But equally, there's others out there, like Ripple, which is a very specific system for ba banks to trade across borders in real time and not have to go through that swift counterparty system that I described with the checks. I was recently at a presentation where the National Bank of Abu Dhabi said that they could drive to Muscat quicker than it would take to send a swift payment. That's why they're using Ripple. But equally, there's other systems out there. There's lots of systems out there. There's about a 1,000 digital currencies out there today. There's a thing that the banks have been investing in called Corda, which is not a blockchain. It's a blockchain-inspired distributed ledger. And this is where we could get technical. I don't want to get technical. But what I will say is that there are four components to most of these distributed ledger databases. One component is blockchain, but it does not have to be used. Another is a digital currency, but you do not necessarily have to have one. The third is a consensus mechanism, and that's probably the most important. And the fourth is a digital signature. And those four pieces together create distributed ledger technologies. And blockchain is just one of those pieces. So the Bank of England has been trialing the idea for real-time gross settlement systems using blockchain. And they said it's not ready for prime time yet. So they rejected it. In fact, the Central Bank of Canada did the same thing. They said, this is not ready for prime time yet. But when it is ready for prime time, it will be transformational. Particularly in what we do, because there's an awful lot of overhead in paper handling in our processes. Just think about supply chain and trade finance, bills of lading, letters of credit. How much goes into reconciling and managing all of that paperwork? Too much in this digital age. If we could replace that with a database that's real time, shared between corporates and commercial banks, tracking and tracing every component in the supply chain as it moves around the world, that would be fantastic. And that's going to happen. In investment capital markets, clearing a settlement is a major use case that we hear about distributed ledger technology, which is why there are lots of people leaving investment banks to create clearing and settlement startup companies, like Blythe Masters at Digital Asset Holdings, which has been working very closely with the Australian Stock Exchange to replace their clearing and settlement system. There's an estimate that we'll save $20 billion a year in overhead in clearing a settlement using distributed ledger technology. And there are many players out there, but the only other one I'm gonna to point to on this slide is in the middle, Settle. Because it's been created by a friend of mine, Peter Randall. And Peter had previously created something called Chiax, which got bought by Batch Trading, and is now Chiax Batch Trading, that's running about a quarter of the equities markets of Europe. When a 10 years ago, it, it, was, it was a startup. Peter knows what he's doing. The chairman of Settle is Sir David Walker, formerly the chairman of Barclays Bank. These are going to change all parts of our business. And it's fundamental industry infrastructural change, not just banking as usual, cheaper and faster. The first place you'll see distributed ledger technology really making an impact is in Dubai, because the government of the city of Dubai has made a commitment to have everything run on a shared ledger system by 2020. And by everything, I mean all digital identity systems for the citizens of Dubai, all commercial contracts between the city of Dubai and builders and contractors and construction workers. Everything on a shared database. Because once it's digitalized, it's resilient, robust, and secure, and far better than paper documentation systems. So this is how banks will change. And this is, I guess, the main point that the banks will become curators of technology, intermediaries of technology. 
They will handle the thousands of companies out there that are doing one thing really well and bring them into their marketplace to serve customers better and give better customer experiences. So collaboration, partnering, becoming open and becoming a, a real collaborator is going to be a big challenge because historically most of our financial inst institutions have been control freaks, proprietary structures running their own business. This is a quote from a st startup that was made at a recent conference I attended. He was introduced by the head of innovation from Bank of Nordea in Oslo. And the first line was, my three-year-old son likes to play with dinosaurs, so do I. Not exactly very respectful of his new bank partner. But this is why fintech to me is the parent and child coming together. The parent is the bank, the financial institutions. And when collaborating, we have the experience and understanding of why we have so much complexity in our products and processes and structures, because we have to deal with that regulatory and government oversight to maintain our secure store of value with trust. That cannot be breached, but the child wants to breach it and change it and destroy it, disrupt it. But the child is in the, the shop. You have to just make sure that they're controlled. But what this particular CEO is getting at is what I feel I see when I walk into most banks' boardrooms. And it makes me very frustrated, because when I walk into most big banks' boardrooms, I'm greeted by this sort of picture. A bunch of old men. And I'm not saying that we need to have lots of young people in the boardroom. Bearing in mind that all those companies I've been talking about that are doing one thing really well are being created by people in their 20s, or even as teenagers, why do we not have more diversity in our banks' boardrooms? And the reason is that banks are run by bankers, the parents. You don't allow children into the boardroom, but maybe we should. And the reason is that when we talk about digital bank or digitalization or digital revolution, how can we create a digital transformation of our existing business if we don't understand digital? If we have no experience of technology? How can we understand the difference between the distributed ledger technology and blockchain that I've just referred to, or digital signatures and consensus mechanisms. How can we know what's more relevant between machine learning, deep learning, and artificial intelligence, and artificial superintelligence? How can we understand any of that if we don't have anyone in the leadership team who knows what we're talking about? 94% of the people who run banks are bankers. That is the failure today, and the challenge. Because you cannot create a digital bank when you only have half of the team. You'll just be a bank thinking in the industrial era of proprietary closed structures rather than open marketplaces of APIs. It's not just a problem of legacy systems, but legacy leadership, legacy customers, things we need to change. I'm just going to take the last few minutes of this speech to say what I've talked about so far is not even revolutionary. All I've talked about so far is banking as usual, cheaper and faster. And yet I've said to you that digital is not about banking as usual or business as usual, cheaper and faster with technology. It's about a complete reimagination of everything in our world. And that's coming out in places that never had banks, that never knew what banking was, in the areas of the world where four and a half billion people were ignored until today because they were too expensive to serve, the underbanked, the unbanked. When I go to Africa, what I see happening is a mobile network transformation where every five meters in the cities, I can find an ATM. It's called a mobile network cash-in, cash-out store. Literally every five meters. And these stores do not offer just cash-in and cash-out, but they offer micro-savings, micro-loans, micro-investments. China's leading the way in this transformation because China didn't really have much infrastructure until the beginning of this century. And so this figure, I think, speaks volumes. In 2016, Chinese citizens made $5.5 trillion of payments through their mobile phones, compared with the measly $112 billion in America, of which $30 billion is on Venmo that I talked about earlier. America is a legacy economy full of legacy infrastructure. That's why they're so reluctant to move off checkbooks China never had credit cards and debit cards, so they've suddenly leapfrogged. 
And that's where, between Africa and Asia, we will see the next generation of financial services in a digital revolutionary form, not in America or Europe. The leading company that's changing the thinking and the game is Ant Financial Alibaba. It's a quarter of my new book, a case study on this one company. And the main reason being is that Ant Financial has done pretty well with Alipay in China, but now they're taking it around the world. So if you take Paytm, for example, which is a rapidly growing mobile wallet in India with 115 million Indian users rising to 250 million in just the last 12 months. That's powered by Ant Financial's Alipay. The technologies, the, the knowledge, it's a partnership between Paytm and Ant Financial Alipay. They're doing the same in Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, Korea, and they're moving into Africa and Europe. I recently hosted uh, a representative for ePASI, which is a partner of Alipay in Finland. And in Finland, the Chinese uh, and financial wanted to take their tourism business and build a bigger service in Europe. And they chose Finland as the first partner, mainly because that's where Santa Claus lives in Lapland. So last year, Ant Financial went, in fact, to seek a partner to bring Alipay into Finland, and they found ePASI, which was a mobile wallet for employees' benefits, and said, you're the partner. They came to an agreement in June 2016. They launched in October 2016, and 55,000 Chinese tourists came to see Santa Claus in Lapland using Alipay. And they stayed three times longer and spent four times as much because they could use the same mobile wallet that they use in China that they could now use in Helsinki and in Finland. The promise to uh, Finland and ePASI is that by 2020, eight million Chinese tourists will come to Finland and gr growing rapidly year on year. The following day after I had that discussion in Finland, I was in Stockholm and I was at a round table of all the biggest banks and their mobile wallets, Swish, Vips, MobilePay, which are the mobile wallets of Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. And they were talking about how they could get interoperability between Denmark, Sweden, and, uh, and Norway. And I just sat there and thought, if I can fly 6,000 kilometers from Beijing to Helsinki and use the same mobile wallet, and yet I can't travel 60 kilometers between Copenhagen and Malmo and use the same mobile wallet, there's a problem. And the way to fix that problem is give me a local language version of Alipay. Just translate it from Chinese. Then everybody in the world would use Alipay. Ooh. <laughs> global platforms with global offerings. In fact, Jack Ma at this meeting said not only that their whole focus is on inclusiveness, but that he runs as a marketplace not a business with a management team, but an ecosystem with a government. He sees himself as e-government of the ecosystem of Alibaba. The thinking is different. Equally, there's another big thing happening in, in, in Africa right now. The United Nations has a range of sustainable goals for 2030, which all nations of the world are working hard to achieve. Goal number 16 is about inclusive societies. Notice this word, inclusive, again. The fourth revolution of humanity includes everyone. And inclusion has a very key objective in goal 16.9, which if they achieve it, will change all of our businesses fundamentally. Because the United Nations wants everybody in the world to have a legal identity by 2030. Right now, one in three people on Earth do not exist, like my wife, because they were never recorded as being born. 2.4 billion people. The first thing a human trafficker does when they abduct somebody is destroy their documentation, because once you have no passport, no driving license, no proof of existence, you don't exist. So what the United Nations is working on, and this is just to show that I was there, <laughs> is the idea of developing a shared database between all governments of the world with all citizens' identities digitally recorded. 
And to prove who you are, you'll just need to have a device with your biometric recognition. And the database will immediately recognize it's you. Everyone on Earth recognized because we are born with an identity. Now, if Africa creates that sort of identity scheme, which is where they're starting the trials, do you really think that we would want people to go into a bank's office with utility bills and passports to prove that we exist? We won't need them. The cost of KYC comes down dramatically. But so does the challenge we have today of things like money laundering. I recently met a former head of money laundering with one of the big banks who's now on a, working on a distributed ledger blockchain startup. And the reason why he's left the bank is that his, his opening line, which I found quite staggering, is that every year there's $1.6 trillion of money laundered through your networks. Money laundered through the global financial networks, $1.6 trillion a year and we only catch 2%. We should probably fire our AML KYC chiefs, but the reason is that we, it's difficult. And yet, if everything is digitally recorded, about 90% of illegal activity in the financial network can be tracked and traced and monitored in real time. That's gonna shut down a lot of avenues for those who have illegal objectives which is why I'm really looking forward to a future that's radically different to the one we have today. Thank you for coming. Chris, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in order to present a memory from today, I'd like to invite General Manager of Halk Yatırım, Mr. Serdar Süreş. Please come. To me. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much. Great to be here.